about when you think about work all right I'm impressed I expected this collective uh. what do you think about though really when you think about work maybe you're thinking I'm it's Sunday I'm trying not to think about work because Monday morning will come all too soon but when you look at the book of Galatia or the, the church of Galatia and the book or the letter written to them the book of Galatians there's a lot of work in that book, and if I had to sum up the whole thing, as I've been looking at it this week, it would be work, uh, servitude. Paul starts off this letter talking to these foolish Galatians who have been uh, talked into abandoning the gospel. So they're serving, they're working for a different gospel. They're working for the works and the will of man. They're working for the law. And Paul spends several chapters talking about how Christ is greater than the law. And how the law is not something that's going to save them, uh, but there would be something greater. And then he gets to chapter 6. And he's still really talking about work, and I think that we can look at this kind of title of being not weary and apply it to these whole 10 verses. We need not be weary when doing the, Lord, doing the Lord's work. We can and we should be active and engaged and proactive in the things that we do for Christ. And we shouldn't be really bowed down with the work of the Lord. Sometimes we feel this way on Friday. Sometimes we feel this way Monday morning about 10 o'clock. We get that way. But do we get really weary when doing the work for the Lord? And let's take a few moments and talk about bearing burdens. In this first section, that's what we're dealing with, bearing burdens. Verses 1 through 3, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man thinketh to himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. We have to be willing to help other folks with their burdens. Something active that we do. This first little bit here, verses, <coughs> or verse 1, we need to cautiously restore the sinful. Those folks who are erring from the truth of God's word, we need to cautiously help those folks who are overtaken. In a fall. What, is, what does it mean to be overtaken? That is something to be surprised. I think it's interesting. That Greek word means to eat before. We had a fellowship meal this morning. Shannon led the prayer. He said amen, and there were like 15 people already in line for the desserts. You know, I wanted some of that pumpkin pie, and I kind of scraped the bottom of it. I was surprised. Where did those folks come from? Sometimes sin does that to us. We are overtaken in a fault. Somebody has, in that same kind of mindset, a fault is a slip, it's a lapse in judgment, it's sometimes it's a label to misdeed, it's a sin. We are overtaken. Sometimes sin surprises us. We're doing really good, and all of a sudden, here it is. We're faced with a temptation out of the blue, and we lapse. We misjudge our ability to be able to handle that, and it surprises us. Sometimes when sin comes, it knocks on the door, and we just open it and invite it in. Satan, hey, I'm here to tempt you today. Well, come on in. Sometimes that's the way sin works, and sometimes it overtakes us. Sometimes it catches us on a day when we've had a rough day, and we feel this way. And it's easy to give in to it. But however it happens, we get overtaken. He says, you folks that are spiritual, that are religious, that are faithful, that are righteous in the sight of God. 
If you have somebody who is overtaken by drug addiction, do you send somebody else who also has a problem with drug addiction to help that individual? No. We need to do that. We need to restore this individual. Restore such a one. Restore somebody who is at fault. What does that mean? When you restore something, what do you do with it? Let's just take this completely out of spiritual things and talk about physical. If you have an old car and you restore it, what have you done? You have brought it back to its original condition. You made it just like it was back in whenever. I know people who restore furniture. I know people who restore cars. They do all this restoration work. And all they want to do is return it back to its original condition. So let's put it back in Galatians. If we're restoring somebody, what that mean? That means that they're not in their original condition, saved, righteous, able to go to heaven. And we need to do what we can to get them back in that restored, righteous, faithful position. How do we get them back inside of the church and away from sin? He says we need to do this with an attitude of meekness. We talked about this some in class this morning, 1 Corinthians 8, how we approach problems. We approach situations, and it needs to be with love. And we said that the one word you use to describe dealing with a problem with love is tact. And sometimes we have a lot of it, and sometimes we don't. If you know a brother or a sister who is outside of Christ, and you take your spiritual baseball back to get them back in the right relationship with God, you may be doing it wrong. How do we, with the spirit of meekness, get folks to come back inside of that right relationship with God? With wisdom, with humility, with submission, going to that individual knowing that their soul is hanging on the balance. And how we handle that situation is going to affect somebody else's eternal destination. We need to keep that in mind. Ye that are spiritual, restore such a one. In the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Considering yourself, you consider something, and that takes thought, it takes time, it takes deliberation. So when you see a brother or sister in error, in sin, you ought to take, and it doesn't have to be months or weeks, but take a little bit of time to think about that brother or sister, to pray for that brother or sister, to contemplate the best way to approach that individual and to help bring them back. And do it carefully lest you also be tempted. That word tempted means to be tried, means to be tested. And here's a kind of a, several play on words that go along here in this little section in Galatians. Our faith is also tested and tempted. We are tested by what we do for God. We're tested by what we don't do for Satan. Satan will try to get us to fall into this same trap, to be surprised by the same sin as this other fellow. We got to help other folks get back. So we need to cautiously restore the sinful. That's something we ought to be working at. But when we look at verses 2 and 3 now, we need to be humbly helping others with their weight. We need to try to get them back into the church, into Christ, into that right relationship with God but when we do that I can't bear their sins for them there's only one man who could and he already has and that was Christ but I can help with some of the weight notice verse 2 bear ye one another burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ if any man thinks himself to be something when he is nothing he deceives himself we can't be above helping somebody else with their burdens that word burden here, and the word burden used for this other brother who's in sin is a different word that's used for our burdens. This is a weight. It is a, a heavy load, something that pulls you down. It brings us down. Notice what he says. Bear ye one another's burdens. This is not an act of convenience. This is a sacrificial act. I go out of my way to put hands on this load to help this brother out. And when we do that, we bear it, we lift it, we carry it, we help them. I can't bear their sins. But when their sins bring them down, I can help them out. I can pray for them, I can encourage them, I can take food to them, I can 
run errands for them while they're in whatever kind of trouble. I, whatever I can do to help, that's how I bear one another's burdens. They have to answer for their sin. I have to answer for mine. But when those things get us down and they weigh us down to the point where we can't hardly handle it, that's what brothers and sisters in Christ are for. And when we do that, we fulfill the law of Christ. And you have to remember that in, Galatia, in the book of Galatians, he's talking a lot about the law and how we're not under the law. And the law was our schoolmaster. What, what is the whole purpose of a fifth grade teacher? Well, what's their purpose in life? To get those students to sixth grade. What's the purpose of a sixth grade teacher? To get their students to sixth grade. The law, the Old Testament, the law of Moses is a teacher that gets the whole purpose is to get us to Christ. You foolish Galatians, you're trying to go back, you're trying to work for the law. You're trying to work for idols. You're trying to work for this other gospel. For the law of Christ, the law of Christ is the one we need to be concerned about. Jesus wants us all to go to heaven. He doesn't want any to be lost. Are some folks going to be lost? Yes. Are most folks going to be lost? Yes. Matthew 7, 12, or 13 and 14. But when we look at it, when we look and examine those folks who are in sin, earnestly and humbly and meekly try to restore those folks in the best, uh, most loving, attackful way possible, part of that is bearing their burdens, taking on that load of care for them to help them himself to be nothing something when he is nothing he deceives himself boy I, you know how many people I've brought back to the church do you know you know how many people's load I've helped to hold on now that word when we look at it thinking of ourselves means the, our opinion of ourself who's the person you can most easily deceive maybe when you're growing up you think it's mom or dad man I am just the wool over their eyes as parents that doesn't work that way they know maybe as a spouse do you think that you have your spouse fooled about this or that maybe it's your employer I can I can deceive my boss and all those folks you may be able to deceive but the number one person you deceive is that person you look at every morning in the mirror we look at ourselves and we see what we look like and then we forget about it we forget about who we really are. James talks about that. We can deceive ourselves more so than anybody else. So when we go to help restore somebody else, when we help bear somebody else's burdens, we need to make sure that we have our own selves in check. Self-deception is the greatest danger to our faith. That's why we cautiously restore the sinful. That's why we humbly help others with their burdens. I think this is interesting. I saw this article this week on uh, an app called Flipboard. It just brings all these news articles together. The Church of England, and I realize it's not the Lord's Church, but the Church of England released this report talking about self-deception. 85% of the people in this report, the Church of England, claimed that they were practicing Christians. They, you know, we're going to church every Sunday. We're faithful Christians. 85%. 33% of those folks said they actively talk about Jesus every single week. So 33% of those folks in the Church of England are actively evangelizing, or they feel they are evangelizing. I talk to people about Jesus every week. And again, this is in England. They said, all right, if 33%, if, if a third of the members of the Church of England are talking to everybody about Jesus once a week, Every non-Christian in England should have a church Jesus conversation every six months, just statistically speaking. That's just the way the numbers worked out. 50% of non-Christians have never had a conversation about Jesus. A third of them said they didn't even know anybody who was a Christian. That's self-deception. Oh, I, I'm talking to folks about Jesus all the time. Well, stop. Back up. What did you really say? Oh, well, I mentioned we had some good pumpkin pie at the fellowship on Sunday. What? what, what? Was that really? Well, I mentioned church. That's talking. No, 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 no. We mentioned a song, or I really meant to. You ever heard of 
That's when there's 100 people, 500. Sometimes we preacher count when it comes to a I meant to, and I, you know, I was so, I'll just go ahead and mark that as I did it. I'll get around to it because I was so close. self -deception. Paul says, if a man thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. We do that a lot, and we need to be careful. Well, I, I have helped so many Christians bear their load, and there are a lot of Christians. You look around, there's a lot of Christians like, I need help. I haven't, nobody's tried to help me. Sometimes we think we're helping and we're not, so we need to humbly help others with their weights. Cautiously restore the sinful. Let's look at verses, uh, the next little section here. Verses 4 and 5, we need to do our best with our own burdens. Now keep in mind, this is not a contradiction in Scripture. Paul says, bear ye one another's burdens, and then he goes and says, bear your own burdens. Two different words are used here, and I think this is very interesting. But let every man prove his own work. He says, lest you also be tempted. It's a very simple word. It says, prove your own work. Prove your own work. And then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let's talk about this for just a second. There's a contrast here. We have to help other folks, and then we have to look to our own devices. There's a contrast here between the self-deception and honest self-evaluation. And every man, right? Let every man. So this applies to everybody. We have to prove. We have to test. We have to try. We have to examine our works in view of the gospel, not the law of Moses, not this false gospel that they had been using, not... And some words of men that they'd also been trying to follow. But we have to examine our work according to the gospel of Christ. We do. We'll see our work. And our work is the product of Christian living. It is the folks that we study the Bible with. It is the, uh, the, the conversation that we have with an individual about the church. Conversions. Folks that we bring into the church through baptism or restore to the church through our means of the things that we did in verses 1 through 3. It's those kind of things that we're looking for. Rejoicing. Not pray. I look, I did this. This is great because we're beginning to get into deceiving our own selves. But it's satisfaction. It's pride. It's a job well done. It's rejoicing in the knowledge that we've helped somebody get to heaven. We've helped somebody's soul be clean. And we can do that in himself alone and not in another. There is no competition among lighthouses. I can't look to Roger or to Dave or to Carlton or Zach or anybody else and say, well, my faith is greater than theirs or my faith's not as great as theirs. I don't compare my work with other folks' work. I compare my work to the mark that Jesus set. And that means there always is going to be work to be done. I compare my work and what I do in Christ to the gospel, evaluating myself that way, not compared to somebody else. Paul talks about in other letters how we're all parts of the same body. Some people are the hands and some people are the feet. Some are the eyes and some are the nose and some are the mouth. And It takes every part of your body to make it work. But I don't compare my hands to my elbows. Obviously, my hands outwork my elbows, I think. But my hands can't get to where they're going unless I got an elbow to get them there. Everybody has a job to do. So we have to evaluate ourselves according with God's word now. That we bear our own burdens. That's what he says in verse 5. For every man shall bear his own burden. This word is not a weight which bears you down. This is a load like as freight. As like a bill of lading. Here's all this stuff on this ship. It also means obligation or invoice. Every man must bear his own accounts. Here's a weight that this brother's carrying that's bearing them down. I have to help them with that. But I have to make sure all of my loads, all of my stuff, all of my work is righteously committed to God. If this is a boat, everything's got to be on the boat. Other folks can help me with my load. But at the end of the day, it's my job to make sure that everything is where it's supposed to be at. And everything is right according to, this word is also essentially a bill of lading. Everything is where it's supposed to be on this invoice. 
and we've checked it off, and it's correct. A requirement. Have we met our obligations to Christ? Think about it in a minute. Other folks can help us with our load, but only we are the person who are able to sign off on the bottom. That phrase, work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, means to sign off on what we have done. Only I know what I have done. Only I can do that and say that it has been done to satisfaction. That's why I say this whole thing is a play on work. When we talk about it, doing our best with our own, Jesus says, help other folks. It's part of what you're supposed to do. Pull everything together, bear our burdens, and he goes on in this next section talking about sowing and reaping. Having everything done according to what Christ would have us to do is something we do for Christ. Sowing and reaping obviously also work. Let him that is taught the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. That means we need to support those who have supported us. Go back and look at verse 6. Let him that is taught. What's that mean? We need to be teachable. Sometimes we're not teachable. Sometimes we want to do our own thing. We want to go our own ways. How do we make ourselves teachable? One fellow told me this one time. He said, we have to show up, shut up, and listen up. You got to be there. You got to be quiet, and you have to be attentive. Maybe a different way to say that. And we have to prepare ourselves to learn. Have you ever thought about it? Paul says that we have to handle correctly the word of truth. You have to have your mind readily available to learn. When you show up for a class and your mind is on something else, how much do you retain? Not a whole lot. Think about a, uh, a fireman or a policeman or a bomb disposal technician. Met with Rudy Russell's family a little while ago to plan that funeral. Rudy was a demolitions expert in the military. When you're setting charges to blow up some bridge, do you have to have your mind prepared and right there? When you're setting dynamite to blow up this structure, do you need to be thinking about what you're fixing to have for lunch? Or what was going on at home? Now, your mind, if you're going walking into a building that's on fire, I suggest that your mind be right there. When we come to learn, to hear a sermon or to go to a Bible class or to sit down and study our Bibles at home, we need to prepare our minds that we are teachable. And we need to have a desire to learn. Do you want to come? to hear sermons and Bible classes, or is there something you do because you have to do it? Do you desire to pick up your Bibles at home and to look at them, or is it just something you think you ought to do? We have to have that desire. And he goes on to say in verse 6, is all about uh, recompensing and making sure uh, teachers got what they deserved, that they were deserving of compensation in the first century. That's how it worked. You would pay the teacher. Or you would live communally with the teacher. Or in the case of a lot of Jewish rabbis, you travel along with the preacher and you pick up, you know, the cost. Essentially, it didn't cost that individual anything to teach you something. You provided for him. What do we do for those folks who teach us the gospel? What do we do for those folks who teach our Bible classes? Now, hopefully, you appreciate what they do. And we all know that the contribution that we give goes to covering some of those costs and expenses. As a rule, we appreciate what we pay for. We make our kids buy things for themselves, right? Why? Because you'll appreciate it more if you spend your own money. I never really appreciated that as a kid, but as a parent, I do. If I have to earn and sacrifice for this, then it means something. I appreciated what I learned in college a lot more than I did in high school. Guess what? Because I didn't have scholarships. All those Sally Maybills came to my house and somebody's got to write a check for that. You appreciate those things a little bit more that you pay for. And that's the idea here to appreciate those folks who have sold with us. Sold the seed of learning and biblical understanding. And then we get 7 through 10. Sowing and reaping righteously. Let's look at verse 7. <coughs> Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. 
If he sows to his flesh, shall flesh shall he reap corruption. But he that sows of the Spirit shall reap of the Spirit life everlasting. And let us be not weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And as we have therefore opportunity, let's do a good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. So let's talk about verses 7 and 8 now. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. You can't pull anything over on God. Let's go back to that tally sheet because that's that bill of lading, that invoice. Because Paul's still using this kind of comparison. God is not some customs agent and you can lie on this form and, and get something through that should not be through. God is not mocked. God is not deceived. God created that invoice. God knows everything that you've done and everything that you haven't done. If you sign off that you are good to go, God knows whether you are or not. You can't pull one over on him. You will receive according to what you have done. Think about it. You sow what you reap, you reap what you sow. A very common phrase, and it comes from the Bible. If you're working for the world, you'll end up in hell. If you're working for the Lord, you'll end up in heaven. That's simply the way it is. If you're spending all your time and money and effort and energy on things that won't last, is that a good retirement program? Is that a good form of life insurance? Now, if you're working for the Lord, life everlasting. That is the direct opposite of corruption. God is keeping this score and tally. He knows where our time is being spent. If we're working for the world and we have no time for God, he, he marks that down. And that's not a good form of insurance. The other day, me and Reg were riding around. And he goes, Dad. This was right after the singing. He goes, you know that song, Blessed Assurance? He says, you ever wonder, you ever think about how assurance sounds a lot like insurance? And maybe we should sing Blessed Insurance. Think about that for just a minute. Let that sink in. Blessed insurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. If Jesus is yours, that is some great insurance. It won't save you 15% or more on your car insurance, but it will get you to heaven. Rich says, Dad, have you ever thought about it? And when I was preparing this sermon, I did stop to think about it. That blessed assurance is insurance. If we are sowing of the Spirit of the Spirit, we will, leave, we will reap life everlasting. And you can't have a greater retirement plan or life insurance, eternal life insurance, than that. What we do then is finish strong by doing our part. God knows what the tally is. We're proving our work. We're doing what needs to be done. We're making sure that it is done with all sincerity. And let us not be weary in well-doing. That weary is utterly spiritless. Worn completely out just spent a lot like this fellow here we are just we can't go any farther that due season that pertains to self as I go this is not of a particular time or as we get farther along now at any time pertaining to myself let, let me not be weary as I go about doing good an opportunity is an occasion. Let us do good unto all men, as we have therefore opportunity. Look at all those correct, all those words we have. Whatsoever, therefore, all this whole section is connected. One thing leads to another. As we have therefore opportunity. Why? Why do we have opportunity? Because we're restoring individuals who are lost. Because we're bearing one another burdens. Because we're going about working the way Christ wants us to work because we're encouraging and supporting our, the folks who teach us in the gospel. Because we're, we're not weary with well-doing. We're, we're plugging along as great as we can. Therefore, we're going to have opportunity. We're going to have occasion. Are we making opportunities? Are we praying for opportunities? Are we preparing ourselves for the opportunities to do good unto all men? And what's the greatest good we can do for anybody? Teach them the gospel or help bring them back to the truth. It's the greatest good we can do for anyone. 
to have a biblical conversation with somebody. A lot of times when we're teaching Bible class, I'll stop and say, what's this verse mean? If somebody comes to work to you tomorrow and say, hey, I read this, what's this mean? Do we have an answer for that? When somebody needs something, are we ready and able and willing to help? It's one of the reasons the anchor group's putting together those blessing bags so that when we see somebody in need, we are ready. We have prepared for an opportunity to help somebody else. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good, excellent, honorable, useful works. Because what we do for others speaks volumes about what we do for ourselves, and the Lord expects us, as his children, to treat others in a certain way. All men, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. What's that mean? Well, that means all men. What's that mean? That means all men everywhere. That means all men everywhere, every when. It doesn't matter when we run across somebody. If we have an opportunity, it's our, it's our responsibility to take it. That's why he says, be not weary in well-doing. Because in we're well-doing, I guarantee you we'll have lots of opportunities. Don't let it bog us down. Let's do our part, especially those of the household of faith. We need to do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith, of the kingdom of Christ, of the family of God. When you look at the entirety of the New Testament, the majority of the benevolence was focused where? Internal. We're helping the church at Jerusalem. We're helping Paul and Barnabas spread the gospel. We're helping with this need here or that need there or this brother needs this. 90 to 95% of all the benevolence in the New Testament was directed inwardly at the church. What are we doing to help our brothers and sisters in Christ? It's great that we can do these blessing bags. It's great that we have a pantry that we can give folks in our area who need food. But what are we doing for the brothers and sisters in Christ who are around us this evening who need things? Are we helping them rake leaves or shovel snow or some physical things they need around the house? Or do we help them because they can't get out anymore? Maybe they need help running the grocery store. Or... Especially those of the household of faith. It's important to remember that we're all a family. If your brother needed something, what would you do? Well, you know what? We're your brother. We're your sister. The church takes care of its own. And as we look at these ten verses... The whole theme is be not weary because we're working. It needs to be working for the law of Christ. It doesn't need to be working for the world or for the law of Moses or anything else. We work. We, we bear each other's burdens. We bear our own burdens. We support those who support us. We sow and we reap righteously because we can't, we can't deceive God. We can't adjust our figures and slant those tables for our own good. We've got to finish strong. We've got to do our part. Because we're working for the Lord. And let's be not weary when we do that. Sometimes it's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to get in that rut and we feel like we're not accomplishing anything. Let's keep our head up as we work for the Lord. Are you laboring this evening for the right cause? That bill of lading, that invoice that shows your work, what kind of stuff does it have on it? We mentioned this uh, last week or maybe the week before last during the marriage retreat, Neil Pollard said one of the things to make your marriage better is to log time. How much time are you spending with your spouse versus your kids or your job or wherever else? How much time are you spending for the Lord versus for your boss? How much time are you spending for the Lord versus your spouse or your kids or your family or your hobbies or wherever else? Are we working for the right cause? What does our time sheet, our eternal time sheet have on it? Is God kind of written in the margins between everything else? And will he be happy with that when we give that to him at the day of judgment? When we sign off on that, work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, when we prove our own works, when we make sure that that's ready to go. We noticed this morning, Paul said, I am ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. I am checking out, folks, Paul says. He's ready to give that sheet, that time sheet to God. He was ready. He said, I'm, I've got it. I'm good to go. Can we say the same thing? What does our timesheet, our invoice, our bill of lading have on it? 
And will God be pleased with what he sees? So you need to make a change. If anything on that sheet is not as it should be, or if you look at it and God's not on there at all, and you say, well, Paul talks about this household of faith. How do I get to that household of faith? If you were here this morning, we looked at that in depth. How we hear the word of God and believe in Christ. How we repent of our sins. We confess Christ. We're baptized into water for the forgiveness of sins. Do you need to be in Christ? Do you need to start logging time and work and effort and energy onto the cause of Christ? Or maybe one of these verses kind of hits you this evening. And you say, you know what, I know folks who have left the church, who, has left, who have left the truth, who aren't in a right relationship with God, and I need to do what, I'm not doing what I can to bring them back. I need to help them, but you know what, I've got some things in my life that I need to get right first. I don't want to turn in this timesheet tonight to God, I'm afraid of what he'll say. If there's some things you need to remove from that tonight, you can come and repent of those things. We can pray for you, we can pray with you. Maybe you just need strength. And you need prayers for encouragement that you can get those things right. This evening, the Lord's invitation is extended. Be not weary. And come as we stand and as we sing.